Good morning, everyone. My name is not Mike. My name is Chris. And our brother Mike is uh, under the weather. And so it's, it's good for us to keep him in our prayers. And in the meantime, I have a psalm here that I'd like to read a portion of. Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and all that swim the paths of the sea. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you stand with me as, I'm not going to stand, stand with you. <clears throat> and let's sing about God's amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You would lay down your life that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations? With truth and justice Shines like the sun In all its brilliance The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my lay down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is unfailing love that you would take my place and you would bear my cross you'd lay down your life that I would be set free Jesus I sing for all 
all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Father, we give you thanks and praise for all that you've done for us. We're not worthy. We don't deserve it. But it is out of your precious, magnificent love that you died for the world. Died that people might have life. And we're grateful this morning that you've given us life. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart. Let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing when your love came down, I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. Yes, I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hands. I will always sing of when your love came down. I will sing of your love. sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. I will sing. I will sing of your love forever. And I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love forever. I will sing of your love I feel like dancing It's foolishness I know But when the world has seen the light They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now They will dance with joy Like we're dancing now I will sing of your love forever. 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 Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth and I will daily lift my hands for I will always sing of when your love came down. I will sing of your love forever. 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 Well, you're welcome to be seated as we continue to sing. Do you normally greet each other and say hello, or did you already do that? No, you don't do that? Okay. Well, I'm going to say good morning to you. Glad you're here. <laughs> it's good to be in the Lord's presence. He loves to have you here. You know, I was thinking this morning on the drive in, I come in from
Preston. And I was thinking, you know, there's probably a million plus songs that are love songs that people have written to each other, right? But of all those millions of love songs, how many of those songs were actually sung to the person they wrote about? Probably one thousandth of one percent. And yet when we write as believers love songs to the Lord, we get to sing them to him. That's pretty cool. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. King of all days, oh, so highly exalted, glorious in heaven above. sake became poor. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely. You're altogether worthy. Altogether wonderful. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. Oh, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon Upon that cross, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say, You're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Is so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the same the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove. Trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood 
and just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. And yet it's sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest And joy and peace How I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus. Uh, first off, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, first off, congratulations to you. Um, one of the tenets of evolution, give or take things, is the, the phrase survival of the fittest. And obviously, since you're here today, you are the fittest that has been able to survive. Uh, we got a whole nother wave of COVID, cruddy, whatever it is going around uh, the, the, the county, uh, and we've been hit by that as well. Uh, in fact, two-thirds of our worship team uh, got called home between services uh, because of some illness and some stuff like that. So anyway, congratulations. Uh, stay safe out there. Stay healthy, people, will you? Awesome. And second of all, I just wanted to say a special thanks to Chris for filling in. Um, Here's a little bit of the backstory on Chris. Uh, our, our normal worship leader rotations are Mike and Susan Coho, uh, and then Mike Berganzel, and they kind of they go back and forth. Well, about three months ago, I believe, Mike Berganzel called Chris and said, hey, you know, I'm going to be leading worship. Would you, would you be able to come and help? And so they worked out, I think it was this Sunday, was set like three months ago, that Chris was going to come down and help lead worship today. On Friday, Mike texts and says, we're sick. We got it. We've succumbed. Um, and we're like, okay, uh, could Chris take over? Because <laughs> Chris is already here. Chris stepped in, into the breach, uh, very willing servant heart, and a completely different worship set than was planned for this week. But uh, thank you, Chris, for stepping up. And then the last tidbit of this is uh, Chris has filled in uh, for me preaching a few times over the last number of years. He's the chaplain at Atascadero Christian Community. But... 30 years ago or so, he was actually the music pastor here at Oak Park. Actually, one of Oak Park's first associates way back in the day. And uh, so thanks for filling in, Chris. We greatly, greatly appreciate it uh, for stepping into the, to the breach today. Um, before we get into the message, uh, today is a special Sunday. It's our promotion and uh, graduate Sunday where we honor those who are promoting, uh, who, who've made it through school, and those who have uh, graduated as well. So we want to uh, highlight just a few people, some of our younger kids who are moving up, uh, those who are moving from uh, elementary into uh, to middle school. 
are Levi Bacon and Ava Corselia. Yeah. And then those moving from middle school to high school, and we actually have a couple of pictures of a couple of our students. Uh, moving from middle school to high school is Caden Crow. And he looks ready to take on whatever high school is going to throw at him, right? You don't mess with Caden. Caden was in, was in first service. Uh, we also have Caleb Brault, uh, who gets to celebrate graduating eighth grade with a trip to Hawaii. That's where they are this week. So uh, I really, really doubt that Caleb and his mom are watching the live stream, but if they are, <laughs> um, no, we're happy for you guys. You get to be in Hawaii. We don't. That's okay. Uh, we also have Austin Stacy, who, uh, who has moved up, uh, Tina Atta, and... One of the great things about Tina, Tina the last couple, three months has been working uh, with our tech team, uh, and she's actually been handling all of like the, the, the slides and all the computer stuff for our worship services the last couple, three months, high aptitude, and has been doing a great job. So congratulations, Tina, and thank you. You don't have to hide behind the computer more than you already are, so that's okay. Uh, then we also have Diego Mendoza, who's finally made it to high school. Diego's the tall one. <laughs> Can't say that too often, but Diego is the tall one on that. Love you to death, bud. We're okay, right? Okay, good. And then we also have a Michaela Sharps, who has moved up to high school as well. Now, for our high school graduates, uh, we have two. First off is Junior Mendoza. And Junior... Junior, come on up. We got a little uh, gift for you and a little, little appreciation. Uh, Junior's just an amazing young man, um, and he is indispensable uh, for things here at Oak Park. Um, constantly working, constantly serving, doing a million different things. Um, and I mean, I guess it's, it's, you've done stuff in the parking lot and help with services. You've rounded up kids. You do everything. But one of the most, one of the most unknown and yet appreciated things that Junior does is that after we have a baptism and the curtains are open, uh, the curtains have warped a little bit and they don't, close per- they don't close perfectly, right? So there's always a little gap there. And of course, you know, you don't, we don't think about that until like service is started or something like that. So Junior is the one I always send on the emergency mission after service is started to go up and clip the curtain. Um, usually having to straddle the water that's still in the baptistry. Um, so if you're ever here to service and you see the curtains rustling, somebody struggling to get the clips on, that's Junior. Man on a mission. And I just appreciate your servant's heart and uh, just excited for your next steps in life. Here's a couple of gifts for you. Uh, it's a, it's a two-book set. It's called Adulting 101 and uh, Adul- Adulting 101 Part 2. Um, so that's just, that's just one start. And then we've got, a, we've got a special gift for you here. Just a way to say thank you for, thank for you. serving so much and helping out. Um, just real quick, what are your plans? Uh, I don't have any. I got nothing. All right. All right. Do you have a job? Yeah. All right. That's, all, that's good. Yep. And our little gift in there will help you on your job. Would you please uh, join me in praying for Junior? Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, for Junior's life, Lord, and how you've just d- cultivated with him within him a heart to serve, Lord, a love for you and a love for, uh, for others, uh, especially a love for children, Lord, and you just, you've just blessed him with such a su- sweet spirit of wanting uh, to serve you and, and to, serve, to serve your people. Lord, I pray for you to direct his steps. Lord, I pray not only for a job, but uh, the job that will provide uh, not only money, but just a real sense of significance, purpose, and joy for him, Lord, as he grows in his faith, as he grows into even a, a, new, a newer stage of manhood, Lord, I pray that uh, you will continue to fashion his heart so he'll become a man after your heart, uh, just like uh, so many who have gone before him. Lord, thank you for making him a part of our family, uh, Lord, and help us to just continue to grow together and serve you together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks, yeah. Junior. Appreciate, thank you. appreciate you, man. Uh, and then also graduating high school is Danielle Hensley. And then we have a few who are graduating with uh, post, uh, post high school degrees. Um, first and foremost, we have Patty Eliza Kimmel, uh, who's graduated with a master's in clinical psychology. 
So congratulations to Patty. We also have Suzanne Berganzel, uh, who's graduated with her Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Engineering, or Bachelor of Science in Environmental Engineering. Oh, and then we have my favorite. <laughs> All right, I do have a gift for you, so come on up. My youngest son, Jordan, graduated from Westmont. And, and so we just have our little card to say thank you. And uh, just a lot of appreciation. Jordan has obviously kind of pretty much grown up here. He has served Oak Park in a number of ways. He was actually our interim youth director last summer. Um, and he's just done a variety of things. And just this week, uh, he received word that he has been officially hired as part of the broadcast team for the Santa Barbara Foresters this summer. So the two really great things about that is it's great experience and it's a great resume builder. There's virtually no pay, but he's out of the house for a couple months. It's not virtually no pay. There is no pay. There is no pay. All right. So we're we're excited about that. Um, And for those who were at uh, Jordan's graduation reception a couple of weeks ago, uh, thank you for that. We really appreciate that. Um, any other plans besides the Foresters? Apply for jobs. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Would you please join me in praying for Jordan? Lord, Lord, I thank you so much for Jordan's life and Lord, his faith and just the, 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 the way you've helped him grow up and mature and the young man that he has become. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to guide him still, his steps. We thank you for this new opportunity with the Foresters. And Lord, I pray it's just a great time of learning and experience. And Lord, I pray for connections as well. Lord, thank you for watching over him, and Lord, I pray you'll continue to direct him even to a fuller sense of manhood as he continues to grow. Lord, thank you for um, just so many things, and thank you for the privilege of him being in our lives and even in the life of this church as well, and we pray for your blessing to be upon him in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, thanks, bud. All right. Now, would you please stand as we read our scripture for today's text? Yep. There you go. You rising up, Tim? Anytime, Tim. We're waiting. All right. Almost there. His, his new chair is so stinking cool. Although, as I said before, it's really creepy when he rolls up behind you while you're sitting and he's towering over you. That's a very different experience. Uh, kind of freaked me out. All right. Our text from God's Word this morning is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. This is God's Word to us today. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. 
Father God, may you honor the reading of your word today with hearing, with understanding. Lord, I pray for the work of your Holy Spirit to take your word and, and to teach us. Those who are gathered in this place, I pray for our hearts and our minds to be focused on you. Those who are joining with us online, either now or even at a later date, Lord, I pray that you will speak. And as you speak, I pray for us to listen. Lord, I pray for the distractions of the world to be pushed to the side. Lord, I pray for any doubt or discouragements, whatever it is, Lord, just to be cleared from our minds and our hearts for a few moments as we seek to receive from you from this time in your word. Lord, I pray that as you speak, we will simply listen and receive what you have to say. Lord, I pray that our understanding of Jesus will be made more clear. I pray that our faith will be deepened. Lord, our loyalty and allegiance to Jesus will be strengthened. Lord, I pray for you to be at work in our lives in a very powerful way. As always, Lord, I ask for my words not to get in the way of your word, but for you to speak, to work, to bring glory to yourself as Jesus is lifted up. And it's in his name that we pray. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, our Lord, your Son, O Father God, amen. You may be seated. This is a pretty incredible and pretty important story in the life and the ministry of Jesus. It's so powerful and it's so, it's so important that all three of the, the first Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, include it. And they include some different details, which has some interesting stuff. But it's such an important, such a seminal story in the the ministry of Jesus because it is far beyond just one of his typical healings. It's not just a work. It's not just a miracle. It's not just a show of power. It is a show of power and a demonstration of who he truly is, which is someone more than just a great teacher, someone more than just a worker of miracles, but truly the Son of Man, the Son of God, God himself who has come in the flesh. And there's so many components to the story. It's so simple, and Mark tells a a very scaled-down version, but it's just so layered, and there's so much going on here. So here's some of the details. This is kind of the setting for what's happening. First off, it takes place in Capernaum. Capernaum was Jesus' adopted hometown. He had grown up in Nazareth, which was a small village up in the hills, but by this time of getting his ministry started, he had relocated, he had moved his base of operations to the little town of Capernaum. Capernaum was on the Sea of Galilee, it was on the northwest shore. And compared to to Nazareth, it was a a bustling city. Only about 1,000 people But when Nazareth was a village of 200 to maybe 400 people, a 1,000 seems like a lot. Nazareth becomes the center, his base of operations for his preaching and teaching ministry. Everything kind of revolved around this little town. It had a synagogue, and evidently it had a pretty pretty well-known and a pretty elaborate synagogue that was very well-respected, very well-attended, and very influential in the area. Jesus did a lot of teaching there and a a lot of appearances. The small town had a Roman tax office, as just about every village did, because the government always needs their money, right? So every town of any kind of substantial population had a tax office. What makes this one so significant is that one of the employees, one of the tax collectors there in Capernaum, was a young man named Matthew. In fact, Matthew is the very next story after ours in the Gospel of Mark. Matthew is that tax collector that Jesus went to and he said, come and follow me. Matthew left behind that life of working for the enemy, of working for the Roman government. Matthew is pretty important. So the little town of Capernaum figures in so prominently to the ministry of Jesus. It also had a small Roman garrison. Now the Roman base, the Roman military base was a few miles south, but Capernaum had like a little outpost, a little station. And we know that it had a centurion there because the centurion in Capernaum comes to Jesus asking for healing for one of his loved ones. That figures prominently into the life and ministry of Jesus as well. So this little town of Capernaum, Once again, so small compared to so many other cities of the ancient world. 
but so significant in the life of Jesus. Jesus is at a home and he's teaching. It's most likely the apostle Peter's home. We're already familiar with this residence. Uh, Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, so we know that he had a home there. His fishing business was located in Capernaum. So this is most likely Peter's house. It's hard to get really a good image and a good picture of homes back then. They're virtually nothing like our homes today with all the different rooms and all the square footage and all the modern amenities and all of that. The typical average home for a commoner in Palestine in the first century, for the the, the livable space that was enclosed, was only about 270 square feet. My guess is probably some of us have closets larger than that, or bathrooms larger than that. But that was that was the com that was the common home. And typically, common homes were maybe maybe four in a, in a unit, kind of around a common courtyard. Because see, most of life was lived outdoors. You there was no electricity, so there was no lighting, there was no air conditioning. So as much time as possible was spent outside in the light where there was room to move around. Houses were dark and and kind of damp and dank and things like that. So a lot was spent outside. And and homes had a courtyard, but homes also utilized the roofs. Roofs were living spaces. They were easily accessible. and You'd go out in in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening, and a lot of life was lived outside. Now, Peter's home probably, or at least possibly, was much larger than just the average common home. You see, Peter was a successful businessman. Peter had a large extended family, evidently, between a wife and a mother-in-law. And if your mother-in-law is going to live with you, you want to put her as far away on the other side of the courtyard as possible, right? So Peter's business, and we know he had a business because he had business partners, James and John and their father. We know he had hired, hired men, hired help. So he had a successful business. His home was most likely larger. It's possible that his house actually had the entire courtyard to themselves. He may have had the other structures there around the courtyard. But even then, it still would be nothing like the square footage or the size or the spaciousness of our homes today. It would still be pretty cramped. We know this from the streets. We know this from the the size of the doorways into the courtyard. They're still pretty small. And as I said, a lot of life was lived up on the roofs of these these structures. So they were easily accessible, and the roofs were simply usually beams covered over with thatch and mud. Some houses had tiles, wealthier houses, but most people just had roofs made of thatch and mud. So you can see that they would be able to to dig through it fairly easily. Still a little bit scary because of gravity and also a little bit messy because the mud would be dried and the thatch and all of that. We have no idea how big the crowd was, but it's possible that crammed into this courtyard and in the other sections of this house, there could have been about 100 people or more there crowded in listening to Jesus We know the crowds followed him and the crowds were always there around him. So this could have been about 100 people crowded into a very compact courtyard area. We know the crowd even spilled out into the doorway and into the streets. So when this entourage came with this this friend who was paralyzed, and it was most likely more than four, uh, because Mark's wording is men came and four of them helped the man up the stair, you know, down. They carried him, and they, then they lowered him. So it's an entourage. Comes. They can't get near to Jesus at all. He's the next character in the story, a paralyzed man. We don't know what happened to his legs. We just know that they didn't work anymore. It's, it's most likely that it had been something happened as an accident, perhaps a degenerative disease. Most likely not a condition from birth, but something that happened later in life. And with that comes a whole host of theological issues. In fact, when when Jesus first, the very first thing that Jesus said is, son, your sins are forgiven, he would have been playing into the common understanding of that time and that time period. Because back then, and, and even a lot of us fall into that same mindset today, we see sin 
sickness. We see hurt, deformity, disability. We see all of these things. Everything that breaks physically or when things don't work right, we see it as punishment from God. We see it as a judgment of God, a curse from God. And life back then was, was pretty rife with that. They saw illness as a sign, uh, and sickness as a sign of being judged by God. And so our understanding is that when Jesus said, son, your sins are forgiven, that's a pretty weird thing to say right off the bat. But it was kind of the unspoken question in the room because you would automatically assume that a man who had been injured or was suffering in this way would be guilty of sin in some form. We see this actually throughout the New Testament. This idea is so prominent. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at a story from John 9. It's where Jesus and the disciples are traveling, and they come across a man who was born blind. And in that story, the disciples, I think, are trying to score some points with Jesus to, to make Jesus think, hey, we've actually been paying attention. And we, we've got a good theological question for you, Jesus. And they come across this man blind from birth. And so the question of the disciples is this, hey, who sinned, this man that he was born blind or his parents? And he's the punishment for their sin. The disciples are kind of saying, look at us, Jesus. See, we're listening. We're paying attention. We're learning this stuff. We're learning from you, right? And Jesus says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. You see, the assumption was because he was born blind, he was being punished. That was the common mindset of the day. So we'll look at that in just a couple of weeks and get into that a whole lot more. So we don't know this man's, what led to this man's condition. We just know that he's paralyzed. His life is now reduced to laying on a mat and being dependent upon his friends. Fortunately, he has some pretty amazing friends. Friends that go above and beyond the call of duty. Friends above and beyond the I'll be praying for you, right? Not knocking that. We always need to be praying. That's a good thing. But these were the kind of friends that were loyal. These were the kind of friends that were there. These were the friends who you can depend on, thick or thin. When their friend was injured or their friend was sick and when their friend's body was, was being broken and no longer working right, they're not the ones who abandoned him. They are the ones who drew even closer to him his great friends. And Jesus even commands their faith because it's actually, it's, it's their faith. They're the ones who got through the crowd in some way. They're the ones who transported a person on a mat, which is kind of like dead weight, very, very heavy. They transported dead weight up the stairs, placed them on the roof, finding a spot where the beam could support the weight and then themselves risking falling through the roof as they tear through the mud and the thatch and then lowering him down uh, that's, a, that's a lot of, lot of um, you know, taking a risk because Jesus could have been offended that he was being interrupted. Jesus could have been annoyed. You see, they, they may have overstepped, but they did it anyway. They're a great faith. And the text says, seeing their faith, Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Uh, we don't even know if the man says anything. The man was probably still trying to catch his breath from his near-death experience of being lowered through the roof. But we don't know. Jesus commends their faith. Their faith was that Jesus had the ability to heal. But their faith also had a determination. They were not going to be stopped. There's such a beautiful picture of Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. May we have those kind of friends who are gonna stick with us and be loyal and not abandon when things don't work out right or when things get tough. May we have those kinds of loyal friends who will bond even closer together. But may we also be those kind of friends, those brothers and sisters in Christ that will bond even closer. So that's the same, that's the context for this. There's some other key players in the story as well. It's the skeptics, the, the teachers of the law, or, or as they were also called, the scribes. The scribes were a whole class of Jewish society. They were scholars. They were very well educated. They were technically lawyers by training. 
They are the ones who taught the law. They are the ones who actually copied the manuscripts. And, and back then, no, no copy machines, no cut and paste like on our computers. Everything had to be done by hand. And that's what they did. They were the ones tasked with copying precisely the Hebrew Bible documents. And as their lives were given to that attention, that devotion, they became experts in the law. And they were ones who were very serious about keeping the law pure and taught accurately and followed. Luke, in his account of this story, he includes one little extra note. He said at this event, that this crowd of possibly 100 people crowded into this courtyard, he says that at least probably most of the crowd were these teachers of the law, these scribes. He said that they came from every village of Galilee, which is the whole region. They came from Judea and from Jerusalem, the bigwigs. The mucky mucks, those at the center of the Jewish religion, they were there in this little backwater outpost to come and hear Jesus. They came because they were intrigued with what Jesus had to say, but they were also very skeptical. And we know from other interactions in Scripture, they were there to pretty much entrap Jesus, to find something with which to charge him because, see, they believed that God had stopped speaking, aside from the Bible, aside from their texts, aside from their prophets. You see, God at this point had been silent for 400 years in their understanding that the last prophet of God to speak was Malachi, and he had lived 400 and some years before. God had not raised up another prophet. Sure, there had been John the Baptist, but that dude was just weird and he was a little bit too out there, and he was a little bit too radical. And so they did not accept John as an authentic voice of God. And then because John had given his blessing, he had, he had, given his, his, uh, he had pointed to Jesus, they automatically dismissed Jesus as well. So even though Jesus had done great works and he had taught great things, and there had been an understanding that we think something is up here that God is doing, but Jesus, you're just saying too many crazy things. They were naturally disposed to not believing him and not accepting what he had to say. And throughout the Gospels, the scribes, these teachers of the law were often lumped together with the Pharisees, kind of the, the professional religious class, the, the pastor class of the Jewish people, so to speak. And there is a contentious relationship between them and Jesus. You see, Jesus is the one who came to bring new wine into the old wineskins of the law. It was Jesus who came not to, not, to, not to counterman the law, but to fulfill the law. But they just couldn't see it. In, in their mind, and in their understanding, the law was under attack. The law was being rejected. Jesus was saying things that, that, that were blasphemous. And so this contentious relationship, and it was mutual. Jesus used the scribes, the teachers of the law, to serve as an example of how not to be a lover of God. He, he, he used them as an example where he condemned their legalism and their hypocrisy. They, in turn, actively plotted to silence Jesus, to get rid of him, yes, even to kill him. So a very contentious relationship. When Jesus says to the man, son, your sins are forgiven, this group, these teachers of the law, immediately understood that as a blasphemous statement. Blasphemy is to slander, to mock, to revile God's nature or power. Even in their own question, who can forgive sins but God alone? It is a rhetorical question. No one can forgive sins but God alone. And Jesus says he is forgiving this man's sin. Blasphemy would be the crime Jesus is officially charged with. 
It is why he is arrested. It is why he is tried. It is why he is found guilty. It is why he is sentenced to execution by crucifixion. Blasphemy was the most serious of all the crimes in their world and in their religious worldview. So this becomes one of the cornerstone pieces of the case they make against Jesus, ultimately, that leads to the death of Jesus. But let's look at Jesus as well. I say to you, son, your sins are forgiven. The young man probably didn't know what to make of that. I'm sure he was happy. He wasn't there for his sins to be forgiven. That's kind of like icing on the cake. He really wanted his legs to work again. But son, your sins are forgiven. And it was not just an extension of grace to this young man, but this is a statement to those who were skeptical. Jesus says, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Well, obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. Anybody can say that. I can say that. You can say that. There's no power. There's nothing behind that whatsoever. But if someone whose legs don't work anymore, do our words matter? I'm pretty certain none of us have that power. That power to say the words or to move the hand or even to lay a hand on and all of a sudden the, the cellular regeneration, the reworking of the nerve system in, in those limbs, to work, I doubt any of us has that power. But Jesus' point is this, so that the teachers of the law, the scribes, the religious experts, so that they will know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, I say to this young man, get up. Take your mat and go home. Walk. Jesus' healing is what val validates and verifies his statement on forgiving sins. But the scribes are absolutely right. God alone has the power to forgive sins. It is his prerogative. Because, see, all sin ultimately is against God. No matter what we do to say and hurt and inflict harm upon others, the, the sins we do that, that, that hurt others and that, that fracture relationships, the, the sin that we even do to ourselves that, that breaks our body and hurts our minds, our spirits, all of that. We sin against others, we sin against self, but ultimately that sin is against God first and foremost. Isaiah 43, 25, I, yes, I alone am the one who blots out your sins for my own sake and we'll never think of them again. That's God's power and his prerogative to forgive sins. And it's for his sake. Now, we receive a pretty awesome blessing when we're forgiven as well. But in reality, God chooses to forgive because it's his power, it's his prerogative, it's his choice. You see, all sin is defined against God's holiness. Sin is that which... That's what, that which violates his holiness, that's what, that which disregards it, that which disobeys his commands for holiness. So ultimately, we sin against others, and they can forgive us, but that does not absolve us of our sin. Absolving of sin only comes from the one whom we truly sin against, and that's God. In his, in his incredibly heart-wrenching prayer and song to God, King David, when he is absolutely crushed by the weight of his adultery with Bathsheba and then his plotting and scheming to kill her husband and, and all the, the, the collateral damage of that awful decision, David cries out from his heart in Psalm 51 and in verse four of that Psalm, he writes, against you and you only have I sinned. Now, he sinned against Bathsheba. He sinned against her husband, Uriah. He sinned against his advisors. He sinned against his other wives, his family. He, he sinned against an unending list of people. But he understands that as great, great and grievous as that sin is, his ultimate debt is to God. So he asks for forgiveness from God. It's God's holiness 
that defines our sin. And so God is the one who can only, is the only one who can forgive sin. We see also that Jesus is able to know the thoughts of the scribes. This reading of thoughts, this knowing of hearts, that is a privilege of God alone. First Chronicles 28 from the, from the Hebrew scriptures, for the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If that does not give you a panic attack and an anxiety attack and keep you awake at night, reread the text. If that alone does not drive you to simply confess and lay everything bare at the, at the, at the feet of Jesus, like, Lord, you already know. I just want to let you know I'm aware of it. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. I'm getting everything out there. Even the motives. Oh, when we, when we cover it up and we, we just you know, we, you know, spit and polish all that stuff, God already knows. That's a privilege of God. And Jesus is demonstrating this power by reading their thoughts. In this context, Jesus uses the healing of the man to prove his, um, pr prove his power and his identity, his authority as God in the flesh, as the son of man. But for us, proof comes a little bit differently. It, Jesus does st still heal He's obviously not here physically. We can't go to him and have him lay his hands on us and, and pray over us or speak to us and heal us. Jesus still does heal, but the, what proves Jesus' authority and power is no longer his physical healing for us. It is the resurrection. It is his return to life after being dead. That is the ultimate proof. That is the historical fact. It is verifiable. It is accounted. It is attested to. It happened. Now, the meaning of it, that's where faith comes in. Jesus died, yes, but why did he die? Well, for, for my sin. You see, that's saving faith. That Jesus dying, historical fact. Jesus dying for my sin, saving faith. Jesus rising from the dead, historical fact. It, it's evidentiary, you know. It, it, has, it has authenticity. It has the witness of history. But what does it mean? Something crazy, something fluky happened. We don't know what it can mean. That's one answer. The other answer is this. Jesus walks out of the tomb. He is Lord. He's in charge. That settles it. That's saving faith. It's a resurrection that proves Jesus' claim to be able to forgive sin. So that's what we rely on. So what can we learn from this story? Here's just a few key points to take with us. We've got to remember that spiritual redemption is more important than physical restoration. Physical healing is temporary. Spiritual healing, which gives life, is eternal. This is not to say that physical healing is not, is not important, because it is and can be. It is not to say that Jesus completely dismisses that and bypasses that now and just lets us suffer. I'm not saying that at all. But we've got to put it into context Jesus said, what is it if you gain the whole world, life, wealth, happiness, but yet you lose your soul? The soul is more important than just the physical life. And one of his really harsh teachings, and it's, it's kind of hard to, to read through, and it's kind of hard to understand, but, but Jesus is speaking very bluntly, very powerfully, very plainly when he says, if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away metaphorical, by the way. There have been way too many people throughout history who've taken that literally, but Jesus here is speaking metaphorically. He's like, do not let a physical weakness or a problem or a predilection or anything else get in the way of your spiritual life. He says, it's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the fire. And so it's, it's metaphorical. Do not, do not mutilate yourself. The body's the temple of the Holy Spirit, so don't mutilate. But get the right perspective. Don't let the physical, and yes, our, our, our physical weaknesses and our, 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 our drives, our desires, all that kind of stuff, do not let that destroy or supersede that which Jesus can do in giving us life. And the other perspective is this. 
while I believe Jesus does still heal, sometimes our most important spiritual growth comes from not being healed. The Apostle Paul serves as an example of this. He talks about a thorn in the flesh in 2 Corinthians 12, and he says, I've prayed to have it taken away. It's, a, it's an emissary of Satan tormenting me. And it was most likely a physical disability, a physical condition. He says, I prayed to have it taken away, but this is how God answered. My grace is sufficient for you. And from that, Paul learns that the grace of God extended to him in his forgiveness, in his eternal life, in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit being with him, that is more important than being pain-free or having everything perfect working in the body. Paul says, in my weakness, then I am strong. In my weakness, I learn to depend upon God. In my weakness, in the pain, in the suffering, in the struggle, we can learn to turn to God and no longer trust just in ourselves. Great spiritual growth can come from that. Point two is this. Jesus, I believe, still heals both physically and spiritually. And I know that there's physical healing that's possible and it may not be as miraculous or instantaneous as the examples we see in the scriptures where Jesus just says the word, Jesus just you know, lays hands on and, and miraculously the, 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 the nerve endings are fixed and the limbs and the muscles and, and the disease is taken away. It may not be that quick and easy. But I know Jesus still answers prayer and the prayers of the self and the prayers of others are answered. But I know Jesus still heals because of the word salvation. The word salvation does not mean get out of hell to go to heaven. That's not what the word means. And oh, in, in, in modern Christianity, we have, we have so missed the big picture. We've so missed the boat on this. We have simply turned the work of Jesus into a spiritual transaction, and it's not a transaction of get my sins forgiven so I can go to heaven and be with God. Salvation is so much more. Salvation, salvation the word itself means healing and wholeness. That's what Jesus came to do, is to heal us from the sickness of sin and the sickness that sin causes Jesus came to bring wholeness to us through forgiveness and life and grace and peace and all, all the other things that he gives us. We, we have the word salve in English. That's the root word of salvation. Salve is what you put on a wound or, or on a burn. It's that ointment, it's that cream. It, it, it protects and it brings healing. That's what salvation is. And when Jesus saves us, that's what comes into our lives. It's not just a get out of hell free card. It's not just a get forgiven, get into heaven by the skin of your teeth. It's a receiving life from Jesus. A restored relationship with God brings the inner healing, a restoration of that relationship, which puts the mind, the heart, and the soul at peace. It brings the inner healing we need in order to pursue healing and healthy relationships with others. Because see, when we are loved by God, we then know how to love others. And as God has loved us with our faults, our failures, our idiosyncrasies, our personality quirks, with our wiring, if we learn that we are loved, we then learn how to love others with their personality quirks, their idiosyncrasies, and their wiring. We learn to love as we've been loved. And Jesus sets a standard for that. As I have loved you, love one another. When we receive God's forgiveness, we learn how to forgive others. Because after all, when we truly look within ourselves and we understand God has forgiven me, he's forgiven those motives that if, if those were presented in a court of law, I would be doing time. And you would be right there with me. You know, If God can forgive my motives and my thoughts and my words and my actions, then I can forgive those who irritate, those who annoy, yes, even those who sin. Forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven you. That's our teaching. 
Paul brings up another great point when he says, when we understand God's grace, we're able to say no to ungodliness. It's in the book of Titus, and he says, for the grace of God has appeared. Jesus, as God's grace has appeared. And, and that, that grace, that, that message of God giving us Jesus is what helps us to say no to ungodliness. And ungodliness is what causes all of our problems within ourselves and within our relationships. So when we can say no to ungodliness, we're making better choices. We're setting out on a better path, a better course. One where we're not going to intentionally hurt or harm or deceive others. One where we're not going to inflict pain upon ourselves. We're not going to break our own bodies, minds, and spirits. We're going to say no to ungodliness and say yes to God's truth and his grace. And from that, so much healing and help can come. And lastly, we see this. The man had to get up. The man had to roll up that mat. The man had to walk and go home. That's what saving faith does, requires, requires response. We've got to do what Jesus tells us to do now that we've been forgiven. We can't just sit there and be satisfied, be content, be complacent, be smug with, hey, I'm forgiven. All's good. I'm just going to enjoy that. Instead, we are forgiven for a mission. We receive grace in order to run the race. That's all the rhyming I'm going to do, I promise. There's got to be something. We can't just sit and soak in God's grace and mercy and be satisfied by ourselves. We've got to do what is God's command to you? If you believe and trust in Jesus, you are forgiven. God says it. God declares it. It doesn't matter what you think or what you feel. It doesn't matter what others think or feel. You are forgiven. What does it mean to live in that forgiveness? To live in that grace, that mercy, that kindness. What is your get up? Take your mat and go home command from Jesus? Is it to love someone you find unlovable? Is it to forgive someone you're harboring bitterness against? What is it? I'd like to have Chris come back up to lead us in a time of praise before we have communion together. And we're going to sing a song of praise. And after we sing, I'm going to have everybody come forward and receive the elements for communion. Then take them back to your seat and we'll partake together. Communion is where we thank Jesus for what he did for us. It's where we honor his sacrifice of taking our sin in his body. It's where we honor him and say thank you for having his blood shed so that our sin could be purified and cleansed. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. It's just a, a, law, of, a law of the universe. God says, because of the blood of Jesus, that blood cleanses us from our sin. And then communion so perfectly represents because as we take the work of Jesus within us, we receive that which gives life, bread and juice, food, water, sustenance. And the body and the blood of Jesus was reunited after his death so that after sin had been paid for, we could have new life, eternal life. So as we stand and as we sing, use this time to, to worship, use this time to pray, to meditate, to simply reflect on Jesus and what he has done for you. Though I can't see your holy, holy face and your throne in heaven above it seems so far away though i can't touch i can't touch your nail scarred hands i have a deep unspeakable joy that makes my faith to stand lord i I'll always believe in you, though I 
I can see you with my eyes deep in my heart your presence I find Lord I believe in you and I'll keep my trust in you let the whole world say what they may no one can take this joy From above, you are God's only chosen one. You're the one and only true way, way to the Father's heart. You died for all sin, and then you rose, and you now live again. Conquering death and pray so that I might live. Lord, I believe in you. I'll always believe in you. Though I can't see you with my eyes, deep in my heart, your presence I find. Lord, I believe in you, and I'll keep my trust in you. Let the whole world say what they may, no one can take this joy away. Lord, I believe in you. Let the whole world Say what they may, no one can take this joy away. Lord, I believe in you. Please come forward to receive communion. And if you would please uh, stand as we partake, of to get, partake together. Communion is open to all who are followers of Jesus. Every person is to examine themselves and reaffirm their faith in Jesus and their trust upon his sacrifice. And by so doing, we then echo these words of Scripture practiced from, from the beginning in the church of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In remembrance of Jesus taking our sin in his body on the cross, we partake. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. In remembrance of a new relationship with God as Father, through faith in God the Son, we partake. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is intensely personal and individual since Jesus died for the sins of each of us and we are all equally forgiven. But communion is also communal, hence the word. This is what we share together as brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you would, along with me, please recite this word, these words of affirmation of our shared faith. Um, this is a great way to bond us together as brothers and sisters in Christ. In the act of communion together, we affirm our faith in the crucifixion of Jesus.
for the forgiveness of our sins. Together, we affirm our faith in the resurrection of Jesus for the gift of eternal life. And together, we declare our shared abiding hope of eternity with our Lord, the Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Um, just a couple of announcements uh, real quick. First off, I want to say a huge thank you again to Chris. So thank you, Chris. And make sure you have uh, downloaded one of our digital bulletins. I think we have a few copies of a, of a printed one available in the Welcome Center if you want that. We do have a number of things coming up over the next few weeks uh, and the next month, and there'll be a lot of other stuff happening this summer as well. Um, if you are newer with us, you've never filled out a connection card, please do so. We'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, so we have a chance to get to know you and find out how we can best help you grow spiritually. You can take a completed connection card that for the, filled out for the first time to the Welcome Center and turn it in. And if you do, we have a special opportunity for you to be a blessing to one of the agencies that helps the homeless situation in our community. Because you're here today, uh, we will give a donation in your name and in your honor to the charity of your choice, People's Kitchen, Five Cities Christian Women, or Five Cities Homeless Coalition, just a way of saying, because you're here, you're making a difference in the lives of those in need in our community. In the back of the row in front of you, there's a prayer request or a prayer praise card. We encourage you to fill that out as well. And uh, other connection cards, prayer cards, and tithes and offerings can be placed in the offering boxes near the exits on your way out today. Um, we do have a celebration of life coming up for Robin DeJong on Saturday. Uh, Robin, a beloved and dear member of our church family who's actually been at Atascadero Christian Community uh, the last few years as a resident there. Uh, we're honoring her life and her faith. Uh, the DeJong family's been a part of Oak Park for a very long time, and Chris was her chaplain uh, and got to really minister to her in some really imp important ways these last couple yep, of years. So we're grateful for the partnership in that. But that's on Saturday. We also have a blood drive coming up in honor of one of our members, Matthew Simon. Uh, Matthew, um, as far as I know, uh, is either still in or is in the final stages of his surgery to receive a ki kidney and liver transplant. Um, he went into that surgery early, early, early this morning. Um, and pretty significant. He's up at Stanford, so continue to pray for him. Uh, but just because of, uh, in, in honoring him, we have a blood drive coming up, so you can sign up for that as well. Um, I'll be available at the front for a prayer if you have some, some questions you may like answered. I'd love to have the opportunity to speak with you. Would you please stand as we close with prayer and a song of praise. Father God, thank you for our time together this morning. Lord, as we go from this place, may we do so. Um, May we, may we get up, take our mat, and go out into the world. Lord, may we live for you and love you and serve you this week. Lord, I pray for opportunities to share your truth, to show your love and your grace to someone who is hurting. Lord, I pray for an opportunity to be compassionate upon someone who really needs just a, a small sign of your grace and your goodness. Lord, also this week, draw us closer to you. Lord, may we just relish and dwell in the fact that we are forgiven. Lord, let the things of the past, let the, the things we perhaps may still struggle with, some of the, the residual, the, the reaping of our sowing and all that kind of stuff, may, may Lord, that be put into just the, the back view for us this week as we really focus on your grace, your goodness, your power to forgive us and to live within us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And these things we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah for that. Yes. And it's good to uh, push through the week with a great song of praise, a love song to the Lord. There is an endless song echoes in my soul. I hear the music ring. Though the storms may come, I am holding on. To the rock I cling How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your praise? I know I'm loved by the King And it makes my 
want to see. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives. And I walk with you, knowing you'll see me through. I'll sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I'm loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. I can sing in troubled times, sing when I win. And I sing when I lose my step, I fall down again. I can sing because you pick me up, sing because you're there. I can sing because you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing with my last breath, sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels and saints beyond the throne. I keep from singing your praise. How can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? Oh, how can I keep from shouting your name? I know I'm loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart want to sing. God bless you all. Keep singing. Sing the name of Jesus. Have a good day. How can I keep from singing your praise? How can I